All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so today we are getting into family problems, uh, and I do just want to say uh, I, I will be uploading the study guide for the last exam, last exam for the next exam uh, later today, and that will that will be next week, next Thursday. Um, it will cover chapters nine, ten, eleven, and fifteen. Excuse me. Um, and kind of like last time, you'll, well, just like last time, you'll have a couple hours to complete it. You'll, you know, have the day, um, the whole day in which, you know, you can take it on your own. Obviously, open note, open book, um, <clears throat> which I think is okay, okay, since, you know, we're covering a lot of material and, you know, in, a, uh, in the midst of a, a major crisis. Um, so far, it doesn't sound like anybody, anyone's having any major problems with the groups. Um, I know some people can't get in touch with group members, um, and I know some people are maybe out of the class, um, you know, might be facing some very adverse uh, circumstances. <clears throat> so just, you know, c contact me if that's the case, um, and you'll just kind of, you know, proceed you know, without, uh, you know, with one or two less group members, and, you know, we'll just kind of muddle our way through towards the end of the semester. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'll be available on Canvas uh, chat uh, today and next week uh, if you have questions regarding uh, the next exam. So we are talking about family and family problems, and, you know, this is a uh, kind of an interesting time to be talking about family. <coughs> Excuse me, my allergies are really bad, and I'm pretty sure this is just allergies. So excuse me, I'll be, probably be coughing more than usual or something. Anyway, so uh, as I said, this is kind of a, a strange time to be talking about families as, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of people around the world are, you know, kind of closed in at home uh, with their families and, you know, for periods of time which we haven't seen, uh, you know, in decades, if ever, you know, if we've ever seen a... You know this large uh, proportion of the population that's been sort of confined with the rest of their families is really it's really something you know incredibly historic and i don't think that has you know still dawned on everyone just the, um, the sort of rupture that we're experiencing in uh you know our society it's a rupture but you know as, as as i've talked about and i'll return to later when we talk about personal health um you know, it's a normal thing, though. You know, epidemics, pandemics, these things happen. So just because they haven't happened in the last few decades and that we've come to be, you know, to the world that we've become accustomed to does not mean that they are abnormal. If anything, they're normal, and the world that we've become accustomed to is what's abnormal. Um, so as I said, families, the reality, of course, is, you know, we'll probably, you know, be going back to work and figuring out new work relationships and so on. And so a lot of the, the problems that we see in society, you know, a lot of the problems come from individuals, uh, you know, who make decisions. And a lot of the decisions they make are based on this, you know, complex interplay of um, their their biology, their biological predispositions, and their social environment. And a lot of their social environment is shaped uh, by their family, uh, especially in their family life. You know, if you take de developmental psych or uh, my social psych class, um, you know, we talk about this in, in some detail. Okay, so I do want to start by saying, first of all, there's a sort of idea, um, in America at least, and, you know, around the world too, that, you know, back in the past was some ideal. You know, there's a lot of nostalgia for some <clears throat> imagined past about, you know, some perfect family that, that existed back in the past that's gone now. And this is something we've seen throughout history. Um, in the American context, the Historian Stephanie Kuntz uh, wrote this famous book, The Way We Never Were, uh, kind of looking at the 1950s. Uh, in modern America, the 1950s is kind of viewed as this uh, ideal time period. Um, 
and she kind of talks about how yeah it kind of looks that way in these in these pictures and in commercials and the shows from back then but when you look at sort of rates of um you know rates of child abuse molestation um uh, domestic abuse domestic violence alcoholism crime rates you know just a whole range of things you know there were there was a lot of bad stuff going on back in the 1950s um and a lot of the picture of the 1950s is looking at white families um and and not looking at at, at other groups at, at um, african americans uh latino latinx families and others um that were experiencing something different um white families also, we're not experiencing what we what we see in those images from that time period. So, um, you know, I think myth busting is always a good thing, especially when it comes to nostalgia, because nostalgia can be very, um, uh, very misleading. I think we see nostalgia driving both now the leading Democratic and Republican candidates. Uh, in the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, you know, make America great again. That's, you know, a nostalgia for, uh, you know, an image of the past. Biden is, you know, he's, he's drawing on the nostalgia of, of the Obama years, that sort of thing. So kind of a very interesting, interesting uh, politics of nostalgia. Okay. Now, looking at the theories, structural functionalism and the family, the structural functionalists, um, you know, they look at family as, okay, what is the role the family plays? Obviously, it's one of the most important roles or one of the most important institutions uh, in, in, in society. Um, it's where people get their basic instruction, where they often learn, uh, you know, their initial morals and, and morality and so on and so forth. Um, there's, there's, you know, debate within psychology and social psychology in particular about which is more, which has a, a greater influence on an individual's behavior, uh, the, the family or peers. Um, it, it's hard to say. Uh, peers, there's some evidence that peers actually uh, have, a, have a greater influence later in life, um, but family plays a, plays a big role too. So anyway, that, there's an interesting, there's a lot of interesting research there. But structural functionalists, you know, this was a dominant early perspective in sociology. Put on the jacket, it's kind of chilly here. I'm in my, if you want to know my family setup, I'm in kitchen actually. Um, I like to lecture in here. I have a good window of the great outdoors behind me. Okay, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, structural functionalists are, are interested in in family and in family roles, what what roles different members of the family play, and how that kind of coalesces together to to create family solidarity or not. Early 1950s structural functionalism uh, was, you know, basically supported the status quo of the time. And it kind of used this idea that uh, women performed what they called expressive roles, uh, you know, emotional care, household chores, you know, the, the maintenance of the family, that sort of thing. Whereas men played instrumental roles, earning, you know, the income and going out to work and, you know, major family decisions, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, as we talked about when we talk about gender, that's all changing now uh, as as women increasingly are, are you know, primary, primary, uh, the primary earners in the family or, uh, you know, co-equal co earners and so on. So this is all uh, changed to some degree, except we still play, see women often playing the, uh, especially the emotive role um, in families, as well as um, the, the doing more household chores. Again, uh, the second shift that we talked about. <clears throat> okay. okay, you know, this is Talcott Parsons. He was a major, um, Structural functionalists, kind of the founders of functionalism. If you're, you know, 
feeling stressed out and having trouble sleeping at night. You know, there's all sorts of medications that, you know, doctors may prescribe you, or you could, you know, check out a book by Talcott Parsons and, and read it. It's, it's, a, it's a very dry, dense, uh, dense sociology. Um, he, has the, he has this, you know, he has this saying, you know, the functions of the family in a highly differentiated society, kind of Durkheimian's division of labor, highly differentiated society are not to be interpreted as functions directly on behalf of the society, uh, but on behalf of, uh, of personality. So what this means is that it's not, no, not so much for the society that, you know, the, the, the chores and, you know, diff different roles are allocated within a family, you know, between different children and, you know, mothers and uh, fathers and, you know, spouses and grandparents and that sort of thing. Um, rather, you know, it depends on their personality and, you know, who they are, that sort of thing. So if you have, for example, um, a, a, a gay household or, or uh, where the parents are, are gay, obviously the, the roles are going to be a little bit different based upon their personalities uh, as opposed to uh, their, their sex, their you know, male or female, uh, that sort of thing. So, so even Talcott Parsons' uh, outdated uh, understandings of of gender roles within within families, you can still use the functionalist approach to understand modern families. In fact, you kind of have to. You just need to sort of update it to today's situation. Really, sociologists have, have drawn more from uh, conflict theory to understand family over the last several decades, although I think functionalism is making a comeback, uh, as I said, but conflict theory is really interested in how things like social class, race, gender, inequalities, th those sorts of things, how they influence um, families. And so for, especially in, uh, especially in family, feminist theory is very important to look at, you know, gender and how how gender changes have also led to changes within uh, marriages and families. And we kind of talked about this already quite a bit in terms of uh, in terms of just g broader gender inequality. So, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can read more about it um, in, in your book. I will say, you know, that we see the roles changing really, really dramatically and very quickly. And I think that's one of the things that's, uh, you know, been jarring for, 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 for a lot of cultures around the world uh, is the rapid change within uh, gender relations. Um, and so anyway, that's, you know, just something to, to consider as, you know, societies change rapidly. Looking, if you want to understand, whoops, want to understand, you know, family and feminism, uh, here, here are a couple of books, you know, that I would uh, recommend. There's, you know, a, <laughs> an enormous wealth of literature, um, of feminist literature, looking at families, looking at family relationships, because so much of gender and women's rights is tied to changes within the family. Um, you know, so, you know, this is just, you know, the very, you know, the tip of a huge, huge pile of, of books and studies and so on and so forth. Um, and obviously much more if you want to investigate that. So, um, <clears throat> symbolic interactionists interested in meaning and how uh, we develop meaning and labels <coughs> excuse me, and how that affects how families behave and how we interpret our roles within families. And so for you know, a long time, symbolic interactionists would look at how families are portrayed on television. And, you know, for a long time, you had a pretty uh, formulaic, you know, stereotypical portrayal, you know, it started to get diversified, but really, you know, um, not until recent, recent years did you really see a lot of diversity. And I don't mean just, you know, ethnic diversity um, or even just cultural diversity, but really diversity in terms of personality and, uh, you know, step families and things like that. You know the whole wide range of different 
forms families can take. Uh, so we're starting to th see that more often. You would typically see what you see kind of below me right now, where you know the typical four, four, <laughs> uh, four person family, you know, a daughter, a son, a, a you know, a husband, a wife, you know, first time married, of course, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, that is not necessarily representative, it is not representative of many, many families uh, in America or around the world. So, um, looking at different types of marriage, uh, there's a wide range throughout history and it's varied by culture and uh, historic or religious circumstance. You have polygamy in which uh, one person can have two spouses. The most common is polygyny in which you have a husband and several wives. Uh, less common is polyandry where you have a woman married to two or more men. You have that generally in very, very small uh, hunting gathering societies. Those tend to be very egalitarian. <clears throat> um, yeah, and, and it's generally, again, it, 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 it's from a sort of functional perspective, it has more to do with um, the size of the population and sort of develop as a result of uh, controlling population size and so on. Um, Congress made, made polygamy out uh, illegal in 1892, um, so it's a crime referred to as bigamy. Uh, in the United States, there are sort of some exceptions for some religious groups, um, but the the laws there are kind of are, are kind of interesting uh, because for the vast vast majority of people, it, it it's illegal in the United States. So. Marriages have become more egalitarian, although they are still patriarchal. Um, between marriages between men and women have become more uh, egalitarian over time. We've just now entered a a period, you know, a very recent, recently uh, allowed marriages between the same sexes in uh, in the United States and in other countries in the world, and so it's you know it's almost too early to know too much in terms of the trends, in terms of, you know, what's, you know, what are gay couples like in terms of e egalitarianism? Uh, are they more egalitarian than, say, uh, heterosexual couples? Um, are may gay, gay male couples different than, uh, you know, gay female couples, lesbian couples? You know, there's a whole range of questions like that that, you know, sociologists are beginning to look at, but, you know, we're, we're in, you know, early years, uh, still very, very early years of, uh, of gay marriage being, being a legal uh, thing, a legal possibility. We've noticed there's been, you know, a lot of uh, divorce. Um, you know, there's been a spike in divorces of the recently gay, in the recently gay, uh, recently married uh, gay population. Now, why that is? Well, there's this, you know, there's a lot of divorce in, in regular populations too, in regular, in, uh, in heterosexual uh, populations as well. So, you know, if anything, it's probably just a function of, of, you know, welcome to marriage, that sort of thing. In America, we have high divorce rates, and that's probably not going to be limited to just heterosexual uh, couples. Okay, moving on to divorce more specifically. One thing you've got is what's called the refined divorce rate. This is the looking at the number of divorces um, per 1,000 uh, married women. And you actually see a big, big increase in divorces um, <clears throat> really, you know, at the same time that you have a big increase in marriages. You know, that's, you know, the reason why you have the big uh, increase in uh, divorces of uh, gay and lesbian households, of gay and lesbian uh, marriages, because, you know, you have, you have a lot of marriages, a lot of marriages, you have more divorces, as you can see in, in this chart here. So the divorce rate that actually has basically stabilized um, over the last few decades. Um, there are questions about COVID-19 and, you know, what, what effect that will have on, um, 
on divorce rates. Uh, there's some <clears throat> preliminary data coming out from China showing uh, higher than normal divorce in some of the provinces that uh, were quarantined for a while. So one, you know, I could you could speculate that you know you could see divorce rates go up because you know these uh, couples who have been you know not been able to you know uh, who have been working and you know they've been in this routine for a while, um, all of a sudden they have to spend a lot of time with each other and maybe you know these underlying tensions come out then and so on and uh, once the quarantine ends we'll see a, a spike in divorce. Or you could see that, you know, people are brought together and, you know, maybe they, uh, you know, find time to spice up their love life and um, do spend time with each other and, you know, realize how much they mean to one another and uh, maybe it strengthens their bond. One could see that happening as well. So what do I think from a sociological per uh, perspective? I would say we're going to see a spike in divorces but not necessarily because of the quarantine. Um, the quarantine may add to it, but I think what's really going to lead to this, a potential spike in divorce will be the financial problems. Uh, we know that financial stresses tend to lead, <clears throat> lead to spikes in divorces oftentimes. Uh, so I think when you see couples that may be financially stressed, then having to quarantine and maybe they've lost their jobs or they've, you know, are struggling now financially, um, you may see them stick together just until they get back on their feet, but then, uh, but then end up divorcing. We tend to see a little bit of a lag there um, because people, you know, divorces are costly. Uh, so, so that's, that's something that we might that we might see. Okay. Um, looking at births, I'm not going to go into this too much, but you know, when we do look, we can kind of when you talk about poverty, we talk about the feminization of poverty, and you know, one of the reasons for the feminization of poverty is that you have a lot of single mothers. Um, and because we don't have a good system of making sure that uh, single fathers are, are 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 doing what doing the best that they can, so there are a lot of single mothers who are really thrown on their own, and this uh, especially impacts populations that are already marginalized, that are already facing uh, discrimination, and are also you know already you know having to deal with the psychological uh, implications of all that, and so so this. It tends to be uh, tends to be uh, harmful uh, in in some ways, at least for 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 a bit. It tends to be harmful in the sense that that we know that two parent, whether married or not, whether uh, you know same sex or not, uh, two two parent families tend to provide more stability than single parent family uh, household generally speaking, not always, obviously, there are abusive two-parent households. Um, but generally speaking, uh, two-parent households offer more stability. So that can become problematic uh, for, for, for kids then. So one thing, again, that I <clears throat> wanted to emphasize that, you know, Hollywood for a long time didn't pay attention to, or at least uh, sitcoms and television shows and so on, were the fact that a lot of, you know, families have siblings that are step relatives, step uh, step brothers and sisters and so on. Uh, you know, huge, huge percentages of, of the United States. And so we're doing a better job of showing this, um, but it's still really not captured in advertisements and uh, things like this. You know, we still pretty much show, uh, you know, the kind of typical heterosexual, uh, you know, nuclear family. Or when I say typical, I mean even uh, my own language is wrong. Uh, stereotypical, I should say, uh, families. And the other thing that we're seeing is, you know, lots of families live with their grand grandparents. Or I should say a lot of um, grandparents live with the rest of their families. And we see this, um, you know, and we see this probably growing again just over the last few years. <clears throat> you know, as we... <coughs> 
You know, we've talked a lot in this class about the growing elderly population. We talked about population growth. Um, and so we see a lot of, you know, kids that are being raised by their grandkids. I mean, <laughs> I hope not. I hope we don't have a lot of kids being raised by their grandkids. <sighs> okay, now we have a lot of kids being raised by their grandparents, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, especially as you have, you know, parents that are trying to, you know, manage complex work situations and stuff like that. And um, this, again, this is going to be something that we see more of demographically, but in terms of coronavirus, this is somewhat problematic. And this is one of the things that people are worried about is, okay, so what happens if, you know, what happens with all the grandparents that are taking care of younger elementary school age kids right now? or have been, I should should say, um, you know, when kids, you know, maybe may have coronavirus but aren't showing symptoms or and so on and pass that on to their grand, uh, their grandparents. So this is a, 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 an issue of public health right now that, you know, there's no easy answer to and it'll become, it'll become interesting to see what we do in the months ahead and especially next fall uh, and next winter with coronavirus and you know if we try and reopen the schools especially the the elementary schools and uh, so on and so forth who's going to take care of some of these kids um, with parents and you know if usually it's the grandparents who took care of them not being able to do that I don't know we're just gonna have to see what happens there Okay, so we've seen that actually marriages have been in decline in, in recent years. <clears throat> so um, there, there's a lot of reasons for this. People are getting married later on in life. So people are having families, starting families later on in life. Um, People are coupling but not getting married, so some of this has to do with the decline in religion. Uh, more of it has to do with individualism and uh, individual happiness. Some of this has to do with uh, the rise of um, women in the workforce, uh, you know, women holding off on getting married until later. So that's that's playing a role. Some of this actually has, to, has more to do with age than anything else. <coughs> age and changes in, in, in the sort of demographic structure of the job market and so on. So anyway, um, again, though, we do see that there, there are problems with single parent families if they're kind of maintained for too long. And we see it more in, in uh, neighborhood to poverty where we see then you know substance abuse and violence and, and uh, some of those some of those things you've also got what's called the the resiliency uh, perspective that basically kind of argues that you know poverty a lot of these things you know are a bigger threat to the well-being of children and, and adults uh, than we see in uh, married to parent families. So in this sense, in this sense, actually marriages of the past were problematic. You had two, you know, you had, uh, you know, two parent families in the past, but they were, you know, one of the reasons why they were problematic is because, you know, women oftentimes were being abused and were not able to leave. Whereas now uh, women are able to leave and families are able to leave and take uh, children out of those situations. So that's viewed um, as being not as much, of a, as much of a bad thing. So what is behind divorce in general? And there's a whole bunch of reasons. A lot of it has to do with uh, changes in divorce laws as a result of, um, you know, a big one being the increased autonomy of women, uh, you know, increase in human rights, women's rights, and so on and so forth. And two that I think are important are uh, increase in individualism as well as weaker social ties. So you have... Um, social ties that have changed uh, dramatically over over time 
individualism. So people, both men and women, you know, are, you know, wanting what's best for them. They don't want to feel too tied down or, you know, perhaps they see, you know, think they see pastures, greener pastures on the other side of the fence, that sort of thing. Uh, so a lot of things are, are contributing to it. I uh, kind of talked about the second shift already. Pause this for one second. All right, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Let me get some more water. My I'm losing my voice, kind of. So I'm going to try and go quickly through the rest of these uh, slides. <clears throat> so, um, looking at divorce uh, again, we know that you know divorce, you know, causes all sorts of stressors on individuals, on children. Um, you know, just the process itself is usually, you know, it's not a fun thing to go through. So, you know, people are, people struggle financially. There's, you know, a, a rupture in friendship groups and family and social ties uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, as I said, the divorce rate has stabilized, um, and hopefully our society is sort of, you know, people are getting better at uh, coupling, you know, with with who they want to be with and stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, as I said, you know, marriage is a complex thing. Any sort of union of two people is going to be a complex thing, especially in a very individualistic uh, society. Economically, we see that there, at least currently, this may change, um, but currently there's a bigger drop in women's income than in men's. Uh, oftentimes, this is because women will often have to change jobs and oftentimes just the nature of uh, our economy and the work that women end up doing, uh, the, the, the jobs end up paying less. So it ends up you know, worsening conditions of uh, inequality, uh, economic inequality between uh, between the genders. And as I've said, um, there's you know a, a range of things that it can it can cause a child. And again, how how badly and how negatively the divorce affects the child depends on the nature of the relationship between the parents and between the children and the parents uh, and how the divorce happens. So, you know, if it's a divorce that needs to happen and, you know, their child's removed from an abusive uh, family situation, then it's going to be traumatic, but it'll end up being a good thing. Um, at the same time, if it's just a nasty divorce where, you know, the children aren't really thought of, you know, then it can be a very bad thing for uh, for the kids. And then you've got, you know, the court battles and custody battles and, you know, the kids can be traumatized from uh, from all of that as well. So, you know, and it depends on the age that it's happening and, you know, sometimes it means moving to, moving in with a parent in a new town or a new school and a whole range of things that, you know, that that come along with uh, divorce that it can impact uh, children. Um, we tend to find that more often than not women get custody um, and that oftentimes divorce can strain relationships with the father. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the roles of gender. Um, they may, may not get more active, uh, may, may become less active, you know, they see their, their kid less and so on. That's changing though. We do tend to see that fathers are becoming more active with their kids uh, when they do have custody of them. Well, what we often see, and you know, I, you know, if you ever get to uh, you have kids and end up divorcing your, your spouse, you know, try not to make the turn the child against the other parent. Um, you know, this can cause obviously problems with that, w w w between that parent uh, and so on and so forth. So it's just, you know, generally, um, generally, not always, but generally a, a bad thing. <coughs> now, of course, uh, you know, what you don't see in the nostalgic pictures of families or many, you know, 
portrayals of families on on television today are are, are abuse of families and all the domestic violence and abuse that can happen within and that does happen within uh, many families. And just in the context of coronavirus, we know that uh, there's been a surge in, in, in domestic violence um, in, in the last few weeks around the world. Uh, this is looking at the Boston Police Department from uh, January 19th to March 20th, or yeah, I'm sorry, January to March sorry, January to, to March in 2019 versus January to March uh, this year, there's been a 40% increase in domestic violence calls. Uh, what's been going on? People have been at home. Um, and, you know, as I said, people are probably losing their jobs. You know, people are, are uh, you know, alcoholics that are, we'll talk about uh, drug and alcohol abuse um, later. There are people, alcoholics who are at home drinking and uh, abusing their spouse. So um, unfortunately, one of the negative repercussions of, you know, enacting social distancing is this increase in domestic violence that we're seeing. And as I said, it's, it's happening. We're seeing uh, reports around the world. In France, they've gone up 30% uh, since the country went on, lo on lockdown in on March 17th. In Argentina, 25% uh, since they went on lockdown in, on March 20th. Cyprus and Singapore, uh, you know, roughly around 30%. Um, you've also seen big big jumps in terms of uh, demand for shelters in other places around the world. So, uh, this again, um, this is one the one of the added tragedies. Of of an already tragic uh, situation. And what's happening is generally a lot of intimate partner violence. So intimate partner violence is the violence that happens between two people that are supposed to be in a loving relationship. Um, or, you know, I say between, but it's often one, uh, you know, victimizing the other. And in the United States, along with everywhere else in the world, women are much, much more likely of being victims uh, than men. So there are different types of it. Common couple violence, where this is generally the type of violence that you see where um, a fight is breaking out and there may be a shove uh, or a hit and it's something that may happen once in a while or something that happens once and never again or you know something that happens very rarely hence the common <laughs> although you know they say it happens rarely i say common couple violence in the sense that it's when violence occurs between a between a couple, this is more commonly how it happens in the context of a fight uh, and that sort of thing of a of a you know verbal vocal fight you know big fight about you know, finances or you know raising the kids or whatever it might be. Then there are the other sort of more more aggressive I think just types of of family violence of partner violence intimate terrorism. Um, this is the sort of you know, where one person just really violently manipulates and controls and someone else through, you know, terror and coercion and, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing where they're, um, you know, making sure the person's home right after work, monitoring their, you know, texts and that sort of thing. Um, you know, we see this usually uh, men controlling women uh, in this way. There's violent resistance. This is oftentimes, you know, one person violently resisting the uh, the intimate terrorism uh, of the other person. Then sometimes this happens less often, but you sometimes where you have two people who are sort of intimate terrorists uh, who are married to each other, and they're both violently trying to control uh, each other. As I said, we tend to see male uh, male perpetrators of intimate violence more often. There's some studies that find women uh, more often, but that's, you know, most, there's a much, much larger voluminous literature of uh, men being the sort of instigators and, and really being the more violent ones and, and abusive uh, partners. There's the one, there's one, the psychopathic abuser who is just, you know, very, you know, 
as the name suggests, psychopathic, uh, intimate terrorism, very, you know, uh, you know, very sociopathic, narcissistic, violent, that sort of thing. You, then you have hostile, controlling abuser. This is the this sort of like on a level less than the psychopathic abuser, um, but you know, maybe controlling of their behavior, uh, that sort of thing. Borderline dependent abuser. I think this is actually, <coughs> excuse me, more common. And I think there's a lot of men today are falling into this category. So borderline dependent abuser are generally men who are may become violent and but are not necessarily they're, they're definitely they don't want to become violent it's something where they become violent maybe in the context of a a, uh, a fight or you know on on under the influence of drugs or alcohol um, but they're not psychopathic and they're perhaps generally not controlling um, but they're often dependent and they're often f suffer from deep depression themselves they've usually been victimized themselves in some sort of way um, and kind of latch on to a usually a, a, a female um, but this ha happens in gay male uh, relationships as well and they become abusive and, be, and feel badly afterward and so they may lash out and then feel you know just terrible afterwards and this worsens their already uh, spiraling sort of depression but then they sort of apologize profusely and then you know this is the uh, relationship where uh, the person's more likely to you know come back in because you know they're not psychopathic and they're maybe they're not usually very hostile um, but they can be in, in, in when they get in these certain situations so anyway Anyway, we tend to researchers have, have identified these the three main types of, of male uh, abusers. <clears throat> so, what makes people stay in a in a relation uh, an abusive relationship? Well, there are a lot of things. As I said, we see <clears throat> um, usually it's women who stay in re uh, abusive relationships, and we see that changing. Um, we see it becoming easier to leave. Um, easier to gain support to leave. Uh, the divorce laws ha have changed. So you have less, you know, um, less reasons. However, you still have a lot of things that are keeping people uh, in, in a relationship. Oftentimes economic dependency. Um, oftentimes they still do love the other person. You know, sometimes they do it for the, for the children. You know, that's a, that's a big reason. Sometimes it's this view that they deserve the, the violence against them. Remember those uh, charts we saw about uh, women believing that under certain circumstances it's okay for you know, a, a husband to hit their wives, um, things like that. So sometimes it's culture, feelings of guilt and fear and so on. Also, you have sort of this cycle of abuse that happens where there's, you know, abuse that happens, then there, there's forgiveness, then it happens again. Uh, you can look at the cycle of abuse here, you know, tensions building up, you sort of like communication breaks down and so on. So on. Then you have the violent incident, say, you know, the person pushes or hits the other hits the other one then the abuser apologizes gives excuses you know say you know it's never going to happen again i won't do this again you know sort of you know things are calm again then you know but after a while tensions build up and we we tend to see people go through this cycle uh quite a bit before they finally if ever uh you know break out of it um, of course, another kind of depressing area of, you know, very depressing area of, uh, of family problems are child abuse. Um, and child abuse can, can take different forms. Uh, direct, you know, physical, mental abuse. Uh, the most common form of child abuse is neglect. So, you know, failing to give the child the attention and, you know, the nutrition they deserve and they need, uh, that sort of thing. You know, this, this tends to be uh, a big problem, especially for kids ages that are infants. Infants are, are the most likely to be abused and uh, neglected. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, one of the tragedies we often see are what's called shaken baby syndrome. Uh, babies who sustain head damage or other uh, other problems as a result of being shaken or hit or something when they, when a kid is younger, uh, usually in response to it not, you know, it keep it keeps crying and the and the parent, um, you know, does something, you know, abuses it as a result. It's, you know, it's really, you know, it's a really sad thing. It's often, you know, parents that, you know, are often stressed and uh, not very well educated and, 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 and things like this. Um, again, as I said, a, a big tragedy. So child abuse, you know, this is something that carries on you know, into the rest of the, the, the lives. You know, a number of my friends when I was younger were, were victims of pretty bad child abuse. Um, you know, and it played out across the rest of their lives and they, you know, engaged in all sorts of behaviors that you see listed there. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you see that people, you know, it plays out in different ways. You know, some people can grow from the, grow from their experiences and so on. Other people are, you know, can make worse decisions and, you know, just sort of uh, gets into this uh, terrible cycle uh, and so on. And I think one of the kind of the really chilling thing is that when you look at pedophiles, for instance, uh, a lot of pedophiles were abused when they were younger as well. They were oftentimes sexually abused too. Um, and so that they, they end up just repeating and perpetuating uh, the, some of these some of these cycles. Um, and I should say, just kind of going back here, uh, you know, this is a topic that, you know, it means a lot to me that, you know, I initially, when I, I spent the first couple of years of college wanting to become a, a psychotherapist for people who had experienced childhood abuse of some sort, uh, specifically sexual abuse. Uh, I was just, you know, kind of interested in that and, you know, think it's such a horrible thing and wanted to help people. And, and then I, after taking some classes, I realized, like, I, I don't have the strength to do that sort of work, or at least I don't think I do. Um, or at least I just would rather be a sociologist and study the big picture or something. Um, but anyway, I have nothing but tremendous respect and admiration for people who, who, who work on these issues because this is, it's a hard, it's a hard field and it's but it's a definitely it's a it's a definitely a very important uh and heroic heroic field anyone who works on you know health care right, you know uh, issues are our heroes right right now and really always I, I think we are starting to realize one thing that I you know that I worry about we're going to see more elderly abuse this is something that's been growing as the elderly population has been growing and perhaps as you start to see more ageism um, you're going to see more elder elderly abuse so the <clears throat> kind of like you know the people most likely to abuse children are their parents the most likely people to abuse elderly parents are their own children. Um, so this is problematic. Um, and it's something that we need to that we need to address. And it's also something that happens in uh, in nursing nursing homes as well. Um, that's you know the lower quality nursing homes, you know, don't screen their employees very well. Uh, and you see you see elderly people being abused there. So as I said, this is something that you know we'll need to work on, especially as we are, as the elderly population continues to grow. The most prevalent form of abuse happen, happening in families uh, is actually a sibling abuse. Um, oftentimes, brothers um, abusing other brothers, but not always just brothers. Uh, so this is this is pretty pretty dramatic, um, and it's something that does not get receive enough attention. Uh, as the other other forms of abuse, and so there are a lot of you know, a lot of people that go <clears throat> go out into the world with you know with um with a lot of trauma from from their siblings, and so they don't have these the loving sibling relationship that we see sometimes portrayed uh, in commercials and in Hollywood and so on. Another form of abuse that's you know sometimes not 
always classified in there, but you know, we're starting to recognize uh, as, as important is pet abuse. I think as our society starts to take animal welfare uh, in general more seriously, you know, we're starting to recognize that, you know, pets are often considered members of the family. And so there are a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, who abuse their pets and who still don't fully understand, you know, the ways in which animals think and, you know, when animals do, do something that, you know, they don't learn, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't always learn in the same ways that people do. So, you know, even when you tell animals not to do something, you know, you always have to remember that they are not necessarily human as much as they, uh, as close as they come. Um, and even as much as sometimes they, you know, you know, they may drive you less crazy than other, other humans. They're, they're definitely not, uh, they're definitely not human. So anyway, um, you know, I think animal welfare is something that we should all, uh, you know, take into consideration and think about that as, as part of, 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 of broader family issues. So the risks, where is, you know, a lot of this coming from? Well, again, it's kind of like aggression and violence in general. Remember we talked about that. Uh, people who are more likely to commit acts of aggression are, it's not necessarily how much, you know, testosterone they have. It's more a result of how much exposure they've had to violence uh, and how much they were uh, victimized uh, when they were younger. So again, we see that, you know, a lot of abusers, they were also abused when they, when they were younger. And so you got to figure out how to break that cycle of abuse, not just for, for, you know, the people getting abused, but for uh, future generations. So it's not just a, um, you know, a, a simple abuser, abused cycle. It's, you know, it's, it's the cycle of humanity. <laughs> to put it on a very sort of grand scale, but that's, you know, that's, I think, how we should think about it. So we know, as I said, alcohol is a big, a big uh, problem here. You know, it's, it's a, it's used in the vast majority of uh, physical and sexual uh, abuse. So that's, that's incredibly important to think about. Um, again, we'll, we'll sort of return to this in more detail when we talk about uh, drugs and alcohol uh, later. So, other reasons that we see this happening, you know, a lot of it has to do with gender socialization and the idea of men thinking of women as property. Um, and again, as I said, we're, you know, we're just now starting to do studies on uh, LGBT families and starting to have a you know, those studies are just coming, just coming out right now. So, I, you know, I, I I think it's still too too premature to, you know, to talk about that in a general sort of class. You know, I think in uh, conferences where you're talking about the research, it's it's, it's appropriate. Um, right now, you know, as I said, it's still very very early days in terms of uh, the legalization of uh, of gay marriage to to really know, you know you know, what those dynamics are in terms of family problems and, and so on. But we know in heterosexual uh, relationships, these traditional gender roles can be problematic and they can lead to uh, some, uh, some of these, these issues of, uh, of abuse and rape and so on and so forth because women and children are thought of as the property uh, of, of men. Now, <clears throat> yeah, anyway. The other thing, sort of coming towards the end, uh, things that are changing, corporal punishment, so complex laws about corporal punishment. So there's still spanking, or spanking is viewed as being, you know, relatively okay by the vast, vast majority of families in the United States. In fact, toddlers are spanked quite a Bit. I was actually surprised to see this uh, three to four times a week. I mean, that's really <laughs> higher than than I expected. Um, so we still use we still see studies where you know people are saying that they use paddles and whips and so on and so forth. Um, so this goes on for quite some time too. So anyway. Um, Corporal punishment is something that's falling, it's declining. We see it more in um, 
amongst poorer families, but it's definitely something that's that's in decline. However, as we see in these, these uh, in these studies, there's still a lot of spanking that that's going on, at least at at the level of the uh, the, the level of the toddler, the age of the toddler, and so on. Um, you know, as I said, uh, these numbers are dropping from 2012 to uh, today. Whoops, whoops, not quite done yet. Uh, going, if you look at 1986, you know, you had rates in the 80s, <coughs> 80%. You still have um, men and women, more men than women. I, let me back up. Back in the 1980s, you had slightly more men than women say that, you know, it was okay that, you know, sometimes uh, kids need to be spanked, but roughly about equal. Um, fast forward to 2012, you know, that's a significant drop in both men and women, but a much bigger drop for uh, for women and a much bigger, bigger gap between men and women uh, in terms of viewing, uh, you know, the necessity of spanking. So that's a big change. So uh, to wrap up family problems, um, we're all, you know, we're all in families of some sort of different family dynamics and, uh, and so forth. We're also just, I just want to emphasize right now that, you know, we're seeing a surge in domestic violence. Um, because of coronavirus and it's happening across the world and so you know I'd you know encourage you to um, you know if you're interested in uh, issues of domestic violence and so on um, to click on the link there and you obviously can't do that on the screen um, but in the slides and the modules when I post those uh, and you know you know kind of look into some of the organizations that are working on um, domestic violence specifically uh, during the coronavirus outbreak. So as I said, I will be posting the study guide uh, study guide today um, and and we'll be you know kind of reviewing some of the material uh, for for next time. I mean for in class, next time there won't be another lecture for for that material but um anyway just contact me if you have any questions about the the study guide the exam uh the project or anything uh hang in there everyone and we will muddle through uh another week all right have a good weekend